evening, everybody. How you're doing today? All right, great, great. So everybody can hear me. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Thank you. And uh, so can you hear me clearly? All right, great. Before we start, anybody had a problem with the muscles lab exam? Does anybody have a problem with the muscles lab exam? All right, so just a reminder for those who did not complete this exam, uh, please make sure to get it completed before midnight tonight, as this is when the exam will close. All right, so if you've got any problem with the muscles lab exam, please let me know as soon as possible. You give me a call on my phone number that has been posted and I will be uh, hopefully available to answer your call. All right, so starting today, our new discussion of the, of the neurotransmitters. If you remember what's a neurotransmitter, a neurotransmitter is going to be the chemicals that gets released from the nerve cells. And if you remember, a nerve cell is going to be formed of cell body where you're going to have the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And you're going to have short tapering processes. Those are what we've called the dendrites. And remember, a long process that will be getting its origin from the cell body of the neuron is going to be the axon. And remember, the junction between the axon and the nerve cell is what we call the axon hillock. And this is where the summation will be taking place, where the electrical impulses are going to be added to one another for you to form an action potential which has the ability to travel for long distances. If you remember, a quick reminder of the different phases of an action potential. Remember, we started first by having a resting membrane potential, which is, can you remind me what was? the polarity of the cell membrane in resting conditions. Negative 70 millivolts, exactly. And remember what happens if you are receiving a threshold stimulus, you're gonna be opening enough sodium channels for you to reach 30 millivolts. We call this first phase, it's the depolarization phase. And do you remember what ion was it responsible for the depolarization? You are allowing what to pass to the inside of the cell? Sodium, exactly. And if you wanted to respond to another stimulus, remember you need to return back to the resting membrane potential. And this is what we've called the repolarization. And remember the ion responsible for you to maintain the pole, 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 polarized state is the pole potassium ion. And remember, those potassium channels are going to be leaking potassium outside of the cell even beyond the resting membrane potential. So this will drive the cell membrane to become even more negatively charged than the resting membrane potential. And we call this phase of the action potential 
it's the hyper polarization phase. Remember how this electrical impulse that was traveling here, the action potential along the length of the axon will be conducted to another cell, either another nerve cell or an effector organ cell. So if I want to conduct the signal to a muscle cell, for example, or to another nerve cell, or to whatever, a glandular cell, or whatever. How would I be able to conduct this electrical signal? Will the electrical impulse pass? Would I be conducting electricity directly from one cell, the presynaptic neuron, to the postsynaptic neuron directly? Will it be conducted as an electrical signal directly from one cell to the next cell? No, it's going to be conducted as a chemical signal that will be released from those terminal nodes or terminal boutons in the telodendria of the axon. Remember, those telodendria did have those bulging ends. This is where you're going to be storing the neurotransmitters inside vesicles. And once you get the electrical signal, delivered to those terminal boutons, what's going to happen? If you remember, you're allowing calcium in, and the calcium will be mobilizing those vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane, allowing you to release the neurotransmitters in the junction between the nerve cell and the next cell. We've seen one famous neurotransmitter, if you remember last class and multiple times actually, back in the muscular system, this was my acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's gonna be located that we've seen back when we study the muscle contraction, it's going to be located at the neuromuscular junction. And it's some of the autonomic nervous system neurons. If you remember, how did we classify the nerves, the nerve cells and the nerves? How did we classify the nervous system? Can you remind me? First, we did classify nervous system into anatomically into CNS, central nervous system, and PNS, peripheral nervous system. CNS included the brain and spinal cord. The PNS, the peripheral nervous system, it's formed by the nerves that would be going in and out. And we've seen some are coming from the brain. Those are called cranial nerves and some are gonna be conducting their signals to the spinal cord, so we call those ones are my spinal nerves. If you remember, we classified those nerves according to the type of signals they are conducting into either motor neurons, motor nerves, or sensory neurons. If I'm conducting a sensory impulse, I'm a sensory neuron. If I'm conducting a motor impulse to go into an effector organ, I am a motor neuron. And remember, what are the different effector organs that you're gonna be conducting those motor signals to? Either muscles or glands. For the sensory neurons, you're gonna be receiving the signals from receptors. So the nerves that are going to be conducting sensations from the receptors, those are my sensory neuro neurons, sensory nervous system. The nerves that will be conducting motor signals to the effector organs, and again, the two main types of effector organs that you're going to be sending the signals to are going to be the muscles and glands. 
remember, if I'm receiving those sensory impulses from my internal organs, like gastrointestinal tract, like my blood vessels, Those are internal organs sending out signals to your nervous, central nervous system for the central nervous system to process them. So if I have increased, decrease in my blood pressure, increased, decrease in my blood sugar levels, increases the degree of stretch of my stomach, all those gonna be conducted through nerve fibers carrying sensory impulses. Here, I'm getting the sensations from the visceral organs, so we classified those nerves as visceral sensory ner nervous nervous system. What if you're receiving the signals from skin, tendons and ligaments, or muscles. If I'm receiving the signals from those sites, what did we call those ones? Do you remember? Somatic, exactly. Because this is my somatic sensory nervous system. We did subclassify the motor nervous system into two main classes. If I'm sending out signals to my cardiac muscles, smooth muscles, or glands, do I have any control on those ones? Do I have any control on those ones? No, they are, are, they are under involuntary control. So we're gonna be controlling them through the visceral motor or another name that we use for it, it's the autonomic nervous system. What if I am sending out motor impulses? This time I do have control on them. This time to my skeletal muscles. What do we call this part of the nervous system? You remember? If the ones that you don't have any control on is called autonomic or visceral motor, what do you think I would call the ones that I have control on? Sending the signals, voluntary, voluntary, yes. It's, it is voluntary, it's a description, yes. It's voluntary, what we call this part of the nervous system, it's somatic, again, motor. Like the somatic here, sensory. All right, so the name of the nervous system is somatic motor nervous system. But it's under voluntary control. Yes, definitely. All right, this is a quick reminder here of the classification that is the milestone here of those chapters. So remember, where do we have acetylcholine released from nerve cells? At the neuromuscular junctions, where the nerve cells gonna be conducting the signals to the skeletal muscle cells, you're gonna be releasing acetylcholine 
also in some parts of the autonomic nervous system. As we're going to see, we have two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. One of them is going to be sending out acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter to its effector organs. And we're going to see other functions of the acetylcholine in the autonomic nervous system when we discuss it in a later, in another, in a later chapter. All right, so today we're looking at the first neurotransmitter is the acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, how come you're going to be sending a signal from a nerve cell to a muscle cell like this? And the muscle cell will be contracting and then it will relax. If I did release a neurotransmitter on here, which is my acetylcholine, didn't the acetylcholine bind to its receptor? If the acetylcholine binds to the receptor, this means it's going to open sodium channels, and the sodium, when it enters the cell, it creates an electrical impulse another electrical impulse, another electrical impulse. Why is the muscle will not be kept contracted by having those multiple electrical impulses that will be formed? What do you think? Is there a way I can relax this muscle if the acetylcholine is kept attached to its receptor like this? No. So what should I do? I will need to break it down. So present in the synapse, in the synapse between the nerve cell and the muscle cell, I have an enzyme that breaks down the acetylcholine. We call this is my acetylcholine esterase. Its main function is to break down the acetylcholine. Why do I need to break down the acetylcholine? For me to limit its activity. So I've sent one signal to the muscle. I want to have one contraction. That's it. I don't want to send one signal and the acetylcholine, if it kept binded to its receptor, the muscle will keep will be kept contracted. If I would like the muscle to be to be kept contracted, I need to send multiple signals from the brain to reach my muscle. So I would be releasing, deteriorating the acetylcholine, releasing and then deteriorate the acetylcholine and then release and then deteriorate the acetylcholine and so on. For me to regenerate those electrical impulses another time in the muscle cell. I don't wanna have a continuous effect of the acetylcholine. I want the signal to be conducted from the nerve cell to the muscle cell. Once conducted, I have no need for the acetylcholine to be kept attached to its receptor. So again, again, what is the name of the enzymes that's gonna be breaking down the acetylcholine? It's my acetylcholine esterase. We have chemical, uh, we have other neurotransmitters that will be classified according to their chemical class. We have got the biogenic amines and the biogenic amines are like the catecholamines and indolamines. Catecholamines include the dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Indolamines, those are like the serotonin and histamine. Serotonin and histamine, those are widely known for relaxation. So 
why do you think chocolate, for example, is going to be enhancing your mood? What do you think? It stimulates the release of serotonin in the brain cells. So it boosts the serotonin. If a person has a depression, do you know a very known family of drugs that we use for depression? Those are called what? Any idea? Very, very, very known. Yeah, antidepressive. Right? Serotonin reuptake inhibitors, exact. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. So what is the effect of the serotonin reuptake inhibitor? They will go and block the reuptake of the serotonin that gets released from the nerve cells. So if this is a nerve cell, it's going to be releasing in the brain serot serotonin. And one of the ways by which we're going to get rid of the serotonin is going to be to reuptake it back into the nerve. So the drug here, it's going to be blocking its reuptake, leaving it out at the junction between the nerve cells. And this will enhance the mood of the patient. So one of the most commonly used uh, family of drugs for depression. Catecholamines, like the dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, as well as the indolamine, serotonin, and histamine, those are broadly distributed in the brain. And they would be playing roles in emotional behaviors and the biological clock. Other neurotransmitters that we are looking at are gonna be the amino acids that will be acting as neurotransmitters, this includes GABA, which is a gamma alpha aminobutyric acid, gamma aminobutyric acid, glycine, aspartate, and glutamate. Those are amino acids that we found that we found that we find out that they are acting as neurotransmitters. They get released from the nerve cells to act on specific receptors on C target cell. Other neurotransmitters, which are peptide chains, we call them neuropeptides. Those are like substance P, and P here stands for pain. Those is the neurotransmitters that mediates pain signals. Endorphins, those are like the natural opiates. So are you in pain right now? What do you think? No, no, no. We've got five no's out of 18, so this means 13 of you are in pain. All right, so are we supposed to be in pain? Just sitting around, doing nothing like this. What do you think? If you're sitting now, or standing up, or you have been walking all day long, you're rubbing your cartilage plates in your joints. 
each time your heart contracts, it's going to be pumping blood that would be rubbing against the wall of your vessels. You're sitting right now on the chair. This is going to be blocking the blood supply to cells. So cells are dying. So are all those should be stimulating pain sensation or at least some degree of pain? Yes. We are actually now, even if we don't have any medical problem, we are in pain. But why? we don't have the perception of the pain on here because of an inhibitory neurotransmitters that we have normally released from the brain that acts as opiates. We call those are the endorphins. And this explains why if a person was abusing drugs and he decided to stop all of the sudden, so he has he had dependence on opiates and he stopped taking any drugs so how he, would he look like you will see him having itching sensation all over his body he will see him he can't tolerate pain why because as we are getting opiates from outside this reduces the ability of the brain to produce it's natural opiates, the endorphins. So the pain perception is going to be increased until the brain starts to reproduce those endorphins. All right. Is this clear? Clear? Does this make sense? All right, great, great. All right, we have another set of uh, neurotransmitters. Those are what we call the gut-brain peptides. Gut-brain peptides, from the name, they are signals that will be released from the gut, from the gastrointestinal tract, to send information to the brain. We call them the gut-brain peptides. This includes the CCK or the cholecystokinin. So if I have food, I did ingest food now. So I had gut stretch in my stomach. And this food is about to get into my small, small intestine. This is where I should be releasing the bile from the gallbladder into the small intestines. This is where the bile released from the gallbladder here will be meeting the food to enhance the digestion of the fats. So who will tell the gallbladder that you need to contract now? Are you contracting the gallbladder all day long, all day long? No, you're gonna only contract it whenever you get food into your small intestine for this bile to meet with the ingested food to help with the digestion. So how your gallbladder will know that you've got food now? So your stomach will do what? Your stomach will be as a as, as it detects an increase in the degree of stretch so it recognizes that you are ingesting food this effect of the stretch will enhance the stomach cells to send out signals to the brain and then the brain is going to be responding by sending down motor impulses to your gallbladder for you to contract the gallbladder and release the bile to meet with the ingested food in your small, small intestine. 
All right, what do we call here this chemical signal that gets released from the gastrointestinal tract? We call this is to induce the contraction of the gallbladder, cholecystokinin. Kinetic, kinetic, or kinin is means what? You know, yeah, move to move. And cysto is a bladder, and coli is bile. So this is a protein that will be moving kinin, the goal bladder, coli cysto. It induces a contraction of the goal bladder to squeeze the bile into the small intestine. Novel messengers that we figured out recently, more recent than the previous ones, more recently, that they act as neurotransmitters. This includes ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, nitric oxide, and carbon monoxide. Neural integration, this is the way the nerve cell is going to be integrating in order to process an information and to forward this processed information to other destinations. So you might be creating a divergence in the same way. This means what? This means that you've got one origin and you're going to have to send out the signals to multiple destinations in the same way. So I'm, go, I'm sending out the signals to multiple muscle fibers, to multiple muscles for them to contract all in the same time, in the same direction. It might be divergent in multiple pathways. So I'm sending out signal that goes to two different pathways. I might have multiple input information to get a single output information. This is like, for example, your cerebellum, as we're gonna be discussing today. Cerebellum is part of the brain that's gonna be responsible to involuntarily coordinate your skeletal muscle movements. So try to imagine you are walking. What information do you need to have if you decided to walk? What information do you need to have in order for you to be able to coordinate the muscle movement? This is my cerebellum on here. What do you think? Yeah, how do I allow this coordination to take place? What kind of information should I be collecting from the different body parts for me to allow a successful coordinated movement? What do you think? Would you like to know where is your head or not? Would you like to know what is the location of your head? Is your head bended forward? Is it upward? Is it on the side? Yes. Do I need to know whether I'm touching the ground or not? Do I need to know uh, how smooth is the ground I'm touching? Do I need to know the, as, as you've mentioned, Najib, uh, the tension of my muscles? How strong is the state of my muscle? Do I need to know the state of my joints that I will be moving? If the joint is already extended or it's flexed, 
Should I know this information before in order to coordinate the muscle movement? So you see a huge amount of input signals. We need to reach the cerebellum for the cerebellum to, to make accurate coordination of your skeletal muscles for you to maintain your body movement balance. Uh, so here I have multiple input information that get into the cerebellum and I have single output information might be going to one skeletal muscle for it to contract to maintain my body balance. We call this as a convergence from multiple sources. It might be convergence in a single source. It might be reverberating circuits or parallel after discharge cir circuit. So how do you think I can store this presentation on a flash drive or on my laptop? Or how do you store a PDF file on a flash drive? Again, what is the movie or the PDF files that you're storing? What is the form? of signals that you are actually storing on this flash drive. A code of zeros and ones, right? Electrical signals and no electrical signal, no electrical signal, no electrical signal, electrical signal, electrical signal. So the binary code on here, this is what you're storing. Codes of having electricity, not having electricity. So yes, definitely you're storing electricity. In the form of code. So, what is the electrical current, which is one, which corresponds to the depolarization in the nerve cells? What's the depolarization? You did open sodium channels. You're gonna be depolarizing the cell membrane. Inside will become more positively charged. Outside will become more negatively charged. What happens next? After you depolarize the cell membrane, after you depolarize the cell membrane, what's going to happen next? You repolarize, exactly. You're going to allow the potassium out. So the inside will return back to its negative state, and the outside will return back to its positively charged, charged state. All right, so will this code be kept in the cell that I've got a depolarization? Or is it traveling along the length of the nerve cell? What do you think? It's traveling along the length of the cell. It's traveling. So how do you remember, how do you create a memory? If all the signals, if vision, if hearing are conducted in, sig in signals of action potentials, those electrical impulses will vanish, right? But how can I keep them as a memory? So I can see something. My ability to see it is this code. But how do I store this code, either on a flash drive or in my brain as memory? So the code here is what I see or what I hear. 
But how do I keep a memory for it? Did you ever open a flash drive from inside and look at it? What do you see inside? You will see circuits. So the signals that I'm conducting here will initiate, will reinitiate the same signal again and again and again for me to create this memory, to keep it, to store it. So what happens if I have degeneration of my brain cells? I will start to lose memories. I am breaking down the circuit. All right. Is this clear? Clear? All right. So Moving on to the homeostatic imbalances that would be related to the nervous system. First homeostatic imbalance that we're looking at today is going to be the multiple sclerosis. If you remember, the nerve cell has a long process coming out from the cell body. We called it the axon. And if you remember, the axon was surrounded by a lipoprotein covering that will act as an insulator. Also, it's going to be responsible to speed up the electrical conduction speed. Remember, the myelin sheath is going to be in an interrupted form. And those gaps between the Schwann cells are what we've called the nodes of Ramvier. In multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease, what I mean by an autoimmune disease, my body started to recognize my own tissues as non-self. What I mean by non-self means that as if they are bacterial cells or as if they are cancerous cells. So it's a faulty immune system. It shouldn't be attacking my own tissues. It should be only attacking any non-self pathogenic cell coming from outside. So this faulty immune system will start to attack the Schwann cells. And like any infection, like any enhancement of the activity of the immune system, how your body responds, it responds by having an inflammatory process. So I have inflammation at the size where I've got the attack of the immune system. Inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And remember, inflammation heals by fibrosis. So what am I ending up with, I'm ending up with sites along the length of my nerves that have fibrosis. They got inflamed and this inflammation ended up causing the accumulation of fibrous tissue. What was the, what was the function here of the myelin sheath? If you remember, I am acting as an insulator. I'm acting as an insulator. So if I did replace the lipoprotein with fibrous tissue, would I have good insulation? No. What would I have? I would have shunting, short circuiting of nerve impulses that would be taking place. What else was the function of the myelin sheath other, other than in, an, in, an insulator to keep the electrical impulse from moving out of the nerve fiber? 
will be to speed up the rate of, or the speed up the electrical conduction along the nerve. So if I have this fibrosis, would I have normal speed of the conduction of the nerve impulses? No, it's gonna be slower, exactly. So the impulse conduction here is gonna be slowing down and eventually ceases. It's a, prog it's a progressive disease. So it progresses over time. Patients will have some remission in between acute attacks. But each time they don't get back to normal. So if I didn't have any symptoms like this, acute attack is gonna be followed by partial remission. I still have some symptoms. So my baseline did move up. On another acute attack, I have another partial remission. So now I have those symptoms. And this is gonna be my baseline. Then I have another acute attack. Then I have partial remission. So now those are my symptoms I will be presenting. So what happened over time, it gets worse over time. All right, so what's gonna be the symptoms on here? I have patients will develop visual disturbances because I need very fast electrical conduction to send out the signals that are gonna be detected from the photoreceptors in the eye. So I'm sending out very fast signals to the brain. So one of the very first things that will get affected by multiple sclerosis will be vision. Other thing would be muscle weakness and other than muscle weakness, I will be developing speech disturbance and some, when it gets worse, uh, patients will start to develop urinary incontinence. Remember, two of the most complicated tasks that we're gonna be performing using skeletal muscles. If you remember from last class when we discussed some of the muscular problems, those are speech and swallowing. They need a large number of skeletal muscles to coordinate together in order for you to either speak or to swallow. Questions, questions? All right, so today we are starting our discussion of the central nervous system, the CNS. If you remember, CNS is gonna be formed by the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is gonna have four main regions. First one is gonna be the cerebral hemispheres. We've got the cerebrum on here, which is formed of two cerebral hemispheres. Another part of the brain is gonna be the diencephalon. And the diencephalon, as we're gonna see, is gonna be formed by an oval-shaped structure here. This is called the hypo, the, the thalamus.
And underneath the thalamus, we've got another region in the brain located below the thalamus. So can you guess the name of the structure located below the thalamus? Below the thalamus, hypothalamus exactly. And above the thalamus, we've got another part of the diencephalon. As we're gonna see, it's formed of two main parts. So what do you think we're gonna name the structure, the part of the diencephalon located this time above the thalamus? Remember, what do we call the top layer of the skin, which is located above the dermis? Epidermis. So what do you think we're going to name the part of the brain located above the thalamus? Epithalamus. Underneath the diencephalon, you're going to have the brain stem, which is going to be formed of three main structures. We've got the midbrain, and then we've got the pons, and finally, we've got the medulla oblongata, which would be connecting the brain to the spinal cord underneath. So what do we call those structures together? This is called my brain stem. And again, three main parts. We've got midbrain, then we've got the pons, and third part on here, the straight part that connects the brain travels through the foramen magnum down to connect the brain to the spinal cord. This is my medulla oblongata. And this is going to be the pons on here. And this would be the midbrain. Located posterior to the medulla and the pons, we've got the last part of the brain that we're going to be discussing today. It's going to be the cerebellum. So the largest portion of the brain should be here. This is my cerebrum. So let me increase its relative size on here for the diagram to make more sense. All right, so again, again, four main parts of the brain we've seen. We've got the cerebrum, which is going to be formed of two cerebral hemispheres. We've got the brain stem, which is formed of three main parts, midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. We've got the region located between the cerebrum and the brain stem. This would be the diencephalon. 
And we've seen the diencephalon has three main regions. We've got the thalamus, we've got the hypothalamus, and we've got the epi, epithalamus. Last part that you've seen here, forming the brain is gonna be the cerebellum. Any questions, any questions? All right, so moving down to the spinal cord. So this is a spinal cord on here. What we're doing, we did take a transverse section of the spinal cord and we're looking at a section of the spinal cord from above. We will see that the spinal cord has an H-shaped gray matter at the center. And at the center of it, we've got a canal. We call this is the central cavity or central canal of the spinal cord. This is my H-shaped gray matter. And to the outside of the H-shaped gray matter, we've got the white matter. So whenever we say gray matter, what this means for, for me, this means that this part of the central nervous system is mainly consisting of cell bodies, of the neurons and unmyelinated nerve fibers. If we're saying white matter, this means for, for us that this part of the central nervous system, this part of the brain or the spinal cord, it's gonna be consisting of large nerve fibers, large axons, which are heavily myelinated. I am formed of myelinated nerve fibers. So again, again, whenever we say gray matter, this equals cell bodies and unmyelinated nerve fibers. If we're saying white matter, this means I'm dealing with myelinated nerve fibers in this location. So this tells you what? What can you understand from this? this gray matter inside is consisting of, again, what and what? This gray matter is consisting of what? It's formed of what? Unmyelinated nerve fibers and cell bodies. Compared to the white matter, it's consisting of myelinated nerve fibers. So this tells me that 
the spinal cord going to be conducting signals up and down in long tracts passing through the white matter or the gray matter? What do you think? So if I did receive a signal from a receptor, I did touch a hot surface, for example. So this was the receptor in my skin. I did touch a hot surface. So the receptor will be sending the signal. This is my nerve cell like this. It will be sending the signal to whom? To the gray matter or the white matter? To the gray matter. Well, why? Because this is where I have the cell bodies that can process the signal. But when the, when the spinal cord is going to be conducting the signal to travel up to the brain. Where will, will it be conducting this signal to travel for long distances where you're going to have myelinated nerve fibers to go up to the brain? Does this make sense? So again, again, whenever we see gray matter, this means I am made a form of, again, cell bodies and some unmyelinated nerve fibers. If we're seeing white matter, this means we are going to be formed of myelinated nerve fibers. And it makes perfect sense on here that this white matter is going to be consisting of the fibers that will allow the signal to travel for long distances. Remember, I need the myelin sheath for me to speed up the electrical conduction. I won't rely on unmyelinated nerve fibers to conduct signals all the way from the spinal cord up to the brain. So I will rely instead on myelinated nerve fibers, which are going to be forming my white matter. Questions, questions? All right, important vocab. If I am dealing with a collection of nerve fibers, what I mean by nerve fibers, again, axons. Nerve fibers are your axons. If you're dealing with nerve fibers, collection of nerve fibers or axons outside of the CNS. Those are called nerves. So what are the nerves? Those are bundles of axons traveling outside of the nerve of the central nervous system. What if this collection of nerve fibers are like those ones here, traveling inside the CNS? We don't call them nerves. Instead, we're gonna call them tracts. So again, again, if I have a bundle of nerve fibers, of axons traveling outside, traveling outside of the CNS, we call them nerves. If I have a bundle of axons, nerve fibers traveling inside the CNS, we call them tracts.
Another thing, if I have collection of cell bodies, if you have collections of cell bodies, if those cell bodies are going to be kept inside the CNS, we call them a nucleus. So we're going to see, for example, the respiratory group formed of nuclei. Those are collections of cell bodies in the CNS, embedded in the brain, forming parts of the brain, forming parts of your uh, spinal cord. We don't call it, we can just call it the gray matter. All right, if those clusters of cell bodies are going to be located inside the CNS, inside the brain, we're going to call them nuclei, nucleus. What if I have collections of cell bodies outside of the CNS, we call them a ganglion, a ganglia. Ganglia, those are collections of cell bodies where outside of the CNS. So for example, if this is my brain, this is my spinal cord, and I told you that in the pons or the medulla oblongata, I have cell bodies that are regulating the respiratory rate, let's say. So, is this a nucleus or a ganglion? What do you think? Cluster of cell bodies of neurons which are located in the pons. Would you call this a ganglion or a nucleus? Two answers. Anybody else? Is this inside the CNS or outside of the CNS? So I have a cluster of cell bodies, like this one, inside the pons. What would we call them? Nucleus. What if I told you here? That when I receive a signal, it's going to be conducted by a nerve, nerve neuron that looks like this. And you're going to have thousands of them. So you have collection of cell bodies located where? Outside of the CNS. So what we're going to call those cell bodies located outside of the CNS? Ganglion. What do you think we're going to call those nerve fibers traveling outside of the CNS? What do we call those nerve fibers traveling outside of the CNS? Nerves. Nerves. If I told you that the signals on here are going to be conducted up through long fibers, what would we call the collection of those nerve fibers traveling through the spinal cord? Tract. Easy, easy. All right, so 
we can have a break for 10. We come back, discuss more about the CNS. All right, so any questions? Any questions before we go to the break? All right, thank you, and we'll see you in 10.